This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with Dr. Justin Juskowicz, Assistant Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo Clinic. Given the national blood shortage, we thought it would be timely to discuss managing a hospital's blood inventory and talk about why it's so important. So thanks for joining us today, Dr. Juskowicz. Oh, it's a pleasure. I always love hanging out with my fellow transfusion docs and get to talk about blood, so. <laughs> right on. So let, let's get started with, um, you know, I think some of our audience, you know, we, we've got uh, students, clinicians, uh, laboratory professionals all uh, chiming into this podcast. So for some of our audience, maybe the importance of a hospital's blood inventory may not seem that at least obviously important. Um, from your perspective, uh, why is the blood inventory important to a hospital? So from my perspective, um, a blood inventory is so critical to a hospital because transfusions really are the lifeblood of many of the things that we do in the hospital. So if you think about the spectrum of patients that we get to participate in the care in, we have trauma patients who are coming through the, the emergency department or coming in via ambulance and helicopter who have life-threatening in injuries and obviously don't have enough of their own blood supply. Um, because of their injuries to support um, the care that they need to undergo. We have patients who have blood cancer and organ cancer who are undergoing either really brutal chemotherapy treatments or radiation treatments or transplantations. Um, all of those things, because of the disease, because of the treatments we're giving, because of the procedures we're giving them, all of them require blood products in order to be successful. Um, and the blood inventory is also important because the blood inventory today is because of the kindness of donors yesterday. Um, as a result, um, we always have to be prepared because we cannot turn around in an instant new inventory um, for our patients. And so having an adequate blood inventory to meet your needs for today and tomorrow because of the lag time it takes to get new inventory in becomes all that more important. Wow, I think that really highlights that, you know, as I hear you answering that, giving us this why, it kind of highlights that uh, blood is uh, necessary, may not be sufficient. That's why we need, uh, you know, our trauma physicians. That's why we need uh, chemotherapeutics. But uh, since blood component is a necessary aspect of this care, like without it, like all the other things really kind of are quite moot. And the more transfusion support we have for those particular patients that need it, the more we can push the envelope in, far, in terms of our surgical technique or chemotherapy or radiation regimens. Um, so it, also, it becomes a facilitator as well. Uh, I, I really like you put that out there. So it really is facilitating innovation. It's really enabling mm -hmm. us to kind of push that envelope, uh, kind of the idea of, um, you know, I, I played water polo in high school and so treading water and, you know, uh, if you're a goalie in the deep end of the pool and you're, you know, you're just got your chin out of the water. Yeah, you're breathing, you're living, uh, but you're not going to be able to block any shots. And, and I think I hear what you're saying is you really need to have a plush inventory uh, so you can enable a lot of this high, high end care. Maybe now, can we, I was curious then, you know, we've certainly been transfusing uh, patients uh, for decades and, uh, you know, there have been a number of at least local shortages and things like that. Um, but uh, I think that COVID really has kind of brought us into kind of a new, uh, a new challenge uh, for our community. And I'm kind of curious, uh, given your role in our hospital-based blood donor program, what have you learned about managing a hospital's blood inventory these past 18 months or so? I would say, first of all, that we globally, um, and not just us helping to manage the blood inventory, but we all globally, I think, in the, in the clinical space, have gained a new appreciation for blood donors and our transfusion inventory um, because of these shortages. And so it's really been highlighted on a national level how critical it is for us to take care of one another through blood donation and everything it facilitates. Um, it's, it's funny, I came, I literally got my, you know, cut my teeth at a time when uh, the blood 
shortage is the worst that many of our senior physicians have ever seen. Um, and so it really has made me appreciate both the supply and demand issues when it comes to managing an inventory. On the supply side, um, one of the things I love about transfusion medicine and my role in the blood center is that I get to spend much of my clinical practice helping other, other people come in and volunteer their time and literally a piece of themselves to help save someone else's life. Um, but having said that, in the COVID era, um, we used to rely on workplace um, mobile blood drives and high school mobile blood drives along with our fixed sites. And COVID, between the, the, the quarantine shutting down of the country, but then also the now redistribution of work environment where everyone, not everyone, but many people are no longer working in a centralized workplace, but are instead working from home and therefore spread out, dispersed across our community much more. It's, it's made that supply issue that much more acute. Um, and it's caused us to have to come up with different ways in which we can engage our donors and meet them where they're at. Because going to some of the bigger workplaces around the community or to the high schools hasn't been an option, uh, which has been just highlighted the key role that um, blood donors are, first of all, because they are some of our best recruiters for other people to come in and donate blood, but also our Cracker Jack uh, marketing and recruitment staff in the Blood Donor Center. Um, it has led to some really cool innovation and different approaches to help overcome that barrier of having to drive into a fixed site and donate. Uh, on the demand side, it's made me appreciate so much more patient blood management. Um, when you have constrained resources as we've had nationally, it makes you appreciate more and more the initiatives we take to avoid transfusion when it's not necessary. And we've been really blessed over the last 10 years or so that we've had um, quite a, um, quite a portfolio of publications that have come up across multiple different domains, adult and now pediatrics, that have demonstrated our thinking about when to transfuse has been, um, and the idea that higher hemoglobins are always better, does not translate into better care and outcomes for our patients. And so the push a few years ago, based on that data to have more restrictive thresholds to not transfuse until we hit a lower threshold than we're used to in terms of hemoglobin or platelet counts, um, that body of work has empowered us to help batten down the hatches and make better use of the products that we do have for the patients in which, the, for the patients in whom there will be the biggest impact. I, I really like, uh, you know, because my heart beats for uh, kind of uh, promoting blood donation, the marketing. I love how you describe the team uh, that you work with here as the Cracker Jack team. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could kind of give us a specific example on, you know, how are they trying to bridge that gap? Because I think you did a wonderful job kind mm -hmm. of illustrating us how, like, you know, the workplace isn't exactly what it was uh, 18 months ago and and how we have to do things differently. And, and maybe what's one example on how they've uh, bridged that gap? So I would say there's a couple of examples. First is diversifying the number of different social media platforms um, and the number of kind of um, people on our dream team who are able to push those messages out so we can have a greater um, greater reach when we have, please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just gonna hop in there and just ask you, yeah. could you, could you uh, elaborate? Our listeners may not know what, what you're talking about when you say our dream team. Uh, yeah. Our dream team are a, a group of individuals across the clinic in the community that we've recruited, our marketers have recruited, who are passionate about blood donation. And so they are our grassroots advocates um, and spreaders of the news, our, our, our town square choir, uh, criers, if you will, when um, not only of ongoing need, but uh, particularly when we have urgent needs. Um, you, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter gets you so far, but really having those individuals embedded across our Olmstead County community who can then be the rallying cry for all the people within their sphere um, has been really huge. And so we call them our dream team. 
Uh, and they really are our dream team when it comes to bringing in donors during um, especially particularly cr critical needs or specific needs that we have to support our patients. Um, so we talked about the diversification of the different platforms. Um, it's also coming up with different initiatives to help bring new donors in. Um, so one of them is the, the Bring a Buddy program that they have been working to bring online. Um, the idea that, um, and I'll speak personally for myself, I'm I remember passing out as a kid, getting blood draws just for clinical testing. And so I had a lot of apprehension, even though I am a blessed Oneg person of coming in and donating because I knew like how I had reacted in the past to just having small amounts of blood drawn. Um, and it was actually my co-fellow who helped me. We went together and helped me cross that threshold. And now um, I donate every 12 weeks, red cells and platelets as needed. Um, and that was a huge jump for me. And so leveraging that, our recruiters are, I've been trying to spin up this Bring a Buddy program to help facilitate bringing new people in who may have had the same apprehensions as I did. Um, because it's always fun, by the way, to go in and do something new when you got someone, you know, a buddy with you. So um, that's been just one example. We have um, other um, promotions and drawings and stuff that have uh, garnered some success. Um, also just changing up our inventory, or inventory, our gift thank you inventory for our donors um, has also garnered some, some pleasant responses from donors as well. Um, but it's been a lot of just aggressive marketing, sharing this and sharing the story of how blood transfusion is so important, but it can't be done without you. Yeah, and I, I love the way how you've really kind of for our listeners laid out a little bit this because I think it's definitely in a black box for a lot of people about where does this blood come from. And, and I think that, you know, you really are highlighting a lot of the work and the effort that is is done in, on a daily basis in order to ensure the, the safety of having a blood supply. How about if we transition on the other side, on the demand mm -hmm. side, you were talking about patient blood management. And I imagine that when the pandemic initially hit, there was that, as you described it, the buttoning down of the hatches. And and um, I guess my, my question to take a a little dive into that is you know that those if you go back to think about those first uh, couple of weeks of the pandemic and how we approach patient blood management to mm -hmm. maybe how are we uh dealing with it now um because certainly in the beginning there was really a concern about shortage and certainly now we've been dealing with this chronic uh severe mm -hmm. shortage nationally um how does pbm look different on the uh, demand on the hospital side how is that so being worked yeah, so um, here locally, there's a couple of different ways that we've been approaching it. So one is for patients who are heading into surgery, especially like planned surgeries. Uh, one of the big initiatives um, that Dr. Matthew Warner, who's the head of our blood management committee here at Mayo Clinic has been tackling it is through a, a pre-op anemia clinic. So better optimize patients' blood counts who are going into elective surgeries to try to eliminate, if we can medically help bolster their own blood supply heading in, that means they need less supply, blood supply um, during the operation. Um, and that has been, um, that is a program that's early in its infancy, but it's one that we're relying on more and more to try to help the patient be in the best possible blood state um, before they hit that the hemostatic challenge of the the operating room i would say um, secondly the the um, development with our knowledge partners here at mayo um, through ask mayo expert in developing transfusion guidelines so these are the appropriate times based on the literature when you need to think about giving transfusion versus not um, i'm really passionate about knowledge management clinical decision support with my informatics background and having those centralized resources that are available um, when the physicians have a question or when they page us that we can point them to saying this has been our this is our institutional approach based on our experience and the medical literature that is out there um, to to advocate for not giving a particular transfusion or in, in other instances giving that transfusion because we know based off of the research and our experience that the impact will be greatest um, so having those guidelines available especially in the the new restrictive blood transfusion kind of paradigm that I talked about over the past 
five years um, has also been a win for us. I would say the, the last thing on the patient blood management side has been our feedback mechanisms to the surgeons and the medical practices. So um, again, through the blood management work of Dr. Daryl Kaur and Dr. Matthew Warner, these, um, and again, I'm an informatics background. So the idea of having statistics coming back about when red cells were given for particular hemoglobin thresholds or when platelets were given for particular platelet counts, while a very high level view and certainly not patient specific per se, um, has been a useful feedback mechanism to look at our global practices across the enterprise and to try to target um, interventions when we see that there is a um, there are practices globally going on that just don't align with what we know are best practices. Uh, I think you've really highlighted uh, for everybody too the this idea that um, maybe the the silver lining that we've had to manage through here. This has really been a learning experience, and a lot of the uh, innovations you're talking about, like for just to give one example of what you've talked about, the the pre-op anemia clinic. You know, right? Mm -hmm. This has been uh, a good idea. This is a good, a best practice out there in our field, and that the pandemic has really kind of spurred the importance of this, and it's getting going, and it's something that's going to continue to help us going into the future, continue to, to uh, serve the needs of our our patients. As you were diving in there, you're talking about uh, you know guidelines and knowledge management, and so uh, maybe if I could dig into that, you know. Uh, for our, our physician audience that's listening to this, uh, how might physicians, so non-pathologists, uh, help their hospital's blood inventory? What are <laughs> some of the kind of practical things that is within their sphere of control that they could help? Yeah, so guidelines are meant for global practices. And so those are the starting points. And so knowing... Um, in the adult patients, for example, um, especially in the particular area you work in, CV surgery, medical patients, what the larger clinical trials out there say as far as what is an appropriate kind of prophylactic transfusion guideline, like when should you start considering below what hemoglobin, below what platelet count should you start thinking about a platelet transfusion in a person versus not. Um, keeping in mind that it's patient specific. So symptomology always trumps. So if you have a patient who has a lower hemoglobin, but it's not below that threshold, but I have a cardiac history and is starting to be symptomatic, that obviously trumps all. Or it's a, a patient who has a lower platelet count, but they're manifesting bleeding symptoms, that clearly trumps all. Um, but knowing those guidelines, and then moreover, knowing lo locally what your transfusion practice um, is, because a each local practice also has their own transfusion practices and being familiar with them and what the latest updates are from your transfusion medicine practice. Um, so that um, during times of crunch, when there are changes in how we're approaching, when we would want to give transfusions or not on a, on a healthcare organization level that you're aware of them so that you can practice those um, and help with those crunches, that would, be, that would be huge as well. And then knowing that there are times when transfusion is not the best option, just like the pre-op clinic that we talked about, that there are other tools in the toolbox, albeit longer term tools that can help um, in some patient scenarios uh, that can help save some transfusion product for those in which we don't have those options. Wow. In your audience there, I in your answer there, I hear you really kind of pointing out the idea of preparing in the effort that goes into something ahead of time, right? Uh, so, you know, dust off those guidelines maybe you haven't looked at in a while or reach out to uh, your hospital's uh, website and look to see or to call your blood bank and find out what is our local guideline practice. Very similar to an earlier answer as you were talking about the kindness of donors yesterday or what allows us to have our inventory today. So, this idea of kind of just in time, we're going to make uh, decisions or something. This is really uh, a challenge for something like a blood inventory when you're talking about larger numbers because these sort of uh, smaller details are, are not going to be able to really steer the Titanic <laughs> to miss Correct. the iceberg. And then also on our physicians, um, for those that are eligible coming in and donating as well as their time permits, um, it's 
physicians and our um, mid-level providers, our nursing staff, respiratory therapists, they are all not only work, can not only, you know, focus on the demand side, but they can also help be part of the supply. So again, since I'm one of the medical directors of the blood donor saying, I'd be remiss not to mention that. <laughs> I mean, that really kind of ties out. This is a pipeline, even though we've been mm -hmm. talking about it as, as a supply and demand side, uh, even though you might be a user of blood, you can certainly help to uh, replenish. And I know that you're mentioning about the different types of employees here at the hospital. And uh, I know that one of our local big time donors is, is an engineer. So mm -hmm. not a physician, not, yep. you know, he, and uh, he's always said to me that, you know, I'm not a trauma surgeon, but this is how I can help out the trauma program, right? Absolutely. So what, let's, let's kind of bring it home and, and just kind of thinking about takeaways. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we also have uh, our learners, our students, and hopefully all of us are lifelong learners. So what do you hope that our learners take away, uh, you know, from these blood shortage challenges that we're, we're navigating right now? I, I think, um, and it, again, it's going to highlight a couple of the things that we've discussed and, and you've brought back around, which is first, it's, it's a system. And as a result, it's a system in which you have to have great planning, great approaches to recruiting donors and great approaches for disseminating best practices on the transfusion side. And as to pick up in your analogy, it is a huge ship and therefore you can't make rapid turns because of all the processes we have in, uh, that we are required to have in order to collect and manufacture and modify these products. Uh, so as a result, it takes a whole community to um, keep the blood supply up and at levels in which we can care for all the patients walking into our door. I would say that's the biggest thing. And then the other, the other message I would have is, yeah, we always talk about the supply and demand sides, the ledger. Blood donation continues to be the one area in which everyone can contribute to medicine, hands down. Uh, if you are eligible to donate, you can help save someone's life. And we rely on the kindness of strangers every single day to help out our fellow man who are going through these really horrible medical challenges. And then on the demand side, we've advanced our knowledge so much over the last several years and, and have integrated that into our practice. And so just knowing that there are, there are guidelines out there, there's support out there if you have questions, including your friendly local transfusion doc, that would be more than happy to help if you do have that knowledge gap. Because ultimately what we found is with these new restrictive policies, it's not only do we save inventory, it's actually better for the patients. And ultimately that's what we all you know, coalesce around here at Mayo Clinic. I think you just made uh, my uh, my medical educator heart go pitter patter. Uh, I think you just about <laughs> encompass all of the ACGME, uh, you know, uh, uh, aspects of care that we want to convey to learners. Thank you so much for rounding with us today, Dr. Justin. I always love rounding with you, Dr. Kreider. <laughs> Have a great one. Thank you. So we've been rounding with Dr. Juskowicz on the national blood shortage and the importance of the hospital's blood inventory. Thank you for taking the time to discuss this topic with us. Thank you to all of our learners for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please follow or subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations. Thank you.